This is the story from Deuteronomy chapter 34 of the death of Moses. Then Moses went up. He went up from the plains of Moab to Mount Nebo, to the top of Pisgah, which is opposite Jericho. And the Lord showed him the whole land. The Lord said to Moses, This land, all this land, is the land I swore to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, saying, I will give it to your descendants. I have let you see it with your eyes, but you shall not cross over there. Then Moses, the servant of the Lord, died there in the land of Moab at the Lord's command. He was buried in a valley opposite Beth Peor, but to this day, no one knows his burial place. Moses was 120 years old when he died. His sight was unimpaired, and his vigor had not abated. The Israelites wept for Moses in the plains of Moab for 30 days, and then the period of mourning was ended. Now Joshua, son of Nun, was full of the spirit of wisdom, because Moses had laid hands on him, and the Israelites obeyed him, doing as the Lord had commanded Moses. Never since has there arisen a prophet in Israel like Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face. He was unequaled for all the signs and wonders that the Lord sent him to perform in Egypt against Pharaoh and all his servants and his entire land, and for all the mighty deeds and all the terrifying displays of power that Moses performed in the sight of all Israel. This is the word of the Lord. Today we arrive at the final chapter of the Moses story. It's a lengthy tale that narrates an adventure that begins with slavery and ends with a view of the promised land. Scholars of the Hebrew scriptures peg the time of Moses and the Exodus in the 13th century before the Common Era. The stories that comprise this epic adventure were handed down orally for centuries before they were finally compiled in a single written narrative. It goes without saying that this story was told from a particular point of view, the view of the Hebrew people. Now that does not mean that the story was entirely fiction. It's certainly based on specific historical events. The Hebrew people were slaves in Egypt. They were liberated by God's greatest servant, Moses. The journey from Egypt to the place where they finally settled was long and arduous. During the journey, they received the laws by which they were to live. The people vacillated between faithfulness and disobedience. And eventually, they reached the land where they lived for centuries. <coughs> the stories are not told to simply preserve a record of the early days of the Hebrew people. Rather, they are told in a particular way that shapes the identity of the Jewish people. Today, much of what passes as American history is told in a similar manner. Our children are taught the story of the United States from a particular point of view in order to create a shared American identity. U.S. history is not taught 
from the point of view of those who inhabited this land for thousands of years before the Europeans arrived. Nor is it told from the point of view of the African Americans or Mexican Americans. Even a story told by European Americans could be quite different. Imagine if it were described by the Tories rather than the revolutionaries. Over the past couple of decades, there have been some modifications in the way U.S. history is taught, but many school systems continue to resist other viewpoints. Scholar John Cobb notes that for many Americans, the role of teaching American history is to incorporate new generations of all ethnicities into a celebratory account that makes us proud of our American identity. Such an account can't dwell on the near genocide of the native people or all of the treaties we broke with them. So it comes as no surprise that the Hebrew people who pass down these stories from generation to generation and those who later assembled these stories into a final written form did not simply state the facts. Like all historians, they interpreted events. They were convinced that God had played a role in all that they had experienced. They detected God's hand in their liberation, their journey through the wilderness, the constituting of their law, and the conquest of other tribes. As we read the Moses saga today, we see one of the overriding themes of this amazing echo. It's that, it's called the Deuteronomic formula. The Deuteronomic formula says, if you are faithful to God, life will go well for you. However, if you are disobedient, life will be harsh. Now, we know that that's an overly simplistic explanation of life. It doesn't always hold up. There are unworthy people who reap good fortune, and there are very worthy people who suffer harsh difficulties. Following their liberation from slavery in Egypt, and after wandering through the desert and the wilderness area for 40 years, the Bible's way of saying an extended period of time, the people needed some place to settle. The promised land refers to a particular plot of land the ancient Hebrews occupied after brutally driving out its inhabitants. Several times in the book of Deuteronomy, the author claims that the land was God's gift to the people. Then in the book that follows, Joshua, the author states that God wanted them to have this land and so God ensured their military victories to capture it. And we need to bear in mind that this interpretation of history is written by the conquering army as justification for taking land away from others. However, the promised land not only refers to a particular slice of terra firma next to the Mediterranean Sea, it's also a metaphor that represents happiness and satisfaction. The promised land represents life as God intends for it to be. The phrase has been used throughout history by numerous poets, writers, musicians. The pilgrims talked about North America as the promised land where they would finally be able to freely worship as they ought. The promised land was used by African Americans in many of their spirituals to sing about a time when they would be free citizens of the United States. Pop musicians Chuck Berry and Bruce Springsteen sang about the promised land. Christians have used this metaphor in two ways. In one sense, the promised land is heaven, where we go after we die. But it's also used as a future point in history 
when God's kingdom is fully realized on earth, when justice prevails and peace reigns. The prophets Isaiah and Micah both offer their vision of the promised land with identical words. They describe it as a time when people shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, nor shall they live and breathe war anymore. In the Gospel of Luke, Jesus gives his own version of the promised land in the first sermon he preaches. He reads, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Four years ago, while I was on sabbatical, Camilla and I stood where Moses stood, on the summit of Mount Nebo. It provides this incredibly sweeping view of this large portion of land that actually may not appear much different today than it did over 3,000 years ago at the time of Moses. If you look to the northwest, 15 miles away, you can see Jericho, a city that by the time of Moses was already 7,000 years old. If you look to the southwest, you can see the Dead Sea in the distance, 20 miles away. It is a breathtaking view. And Moses may not have believed his eyes. After all those years, with all that turmoil, and dragging those stiff-necked people year after year toward this place, he can't believe that he finally laid his eyes on it. But laid his eyes on it is all. It's one of the great ironies of the Bible that Moses liberated his people from slavery, led them through the trials of the wilderness, endured constant complaining for 40 years, and delivered them to the promised land, but then died before stepping into it. But isn't that what makes it such an apt metaphor for the life of faith? We catch glimpses of the promised land, and we strive to do our part in making it a reality, even though we know we won't ever get there in this lifetime. These days, it feels as if the promised land is far, far away with people feeling emboldened to express views that are racist, homophobic, and xenophobic, it feels as if we have trekked back down Mount Nebo, back into the wilderness again. But dark powers put up their greatest fight when they fear they are about to be conquered. Life is a series of challenges. Like Moses, people of faith are challenged daily to prove that our commitment to God is genuine. More than a thousand years after the time of Moses, Jesus was asked, which commandment in the law is the greatest? And what did he do? He quoted from the Moses saga. He said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and strength. Leviticus, Deuteronomy, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself, Leviticus. We see glimpses of the promised land when people who are hungry are fed out of our abundance. We see glimpses of the holy land and the promised land when people of different races are treated with respect. Respect. 
We see glimpses of the promised land when people of different sexual orientations are welcomed and treated equally. We see glimpses of the Holy Land when people are together caring for God's creation. We see glimpses of the promised land when people of different faiths are able to sit together at a table and respect each other and learn from each other. We do not get to the promised land until we live like citizens of the promised land. We dare not act like the complainers in the wilderness, constantly bemoaning our difficulties. Instead, we must focus on what we can do in our sphere of influence. One scholar reminds us that it does not take everybody on earth to bring justice and peace, but only a small, determined group who will not give up. If that's not the body of Christ, I don't know who it's supposed to be. We can live as if we will never escape the wilderness. Or we can live as people who have glimpsed the promised land.